the, the, there seem to be two problems, and I, I guess it's good to ask you, Hume, because I've thought about this. So there's two problems, and I've noticed they get sometimes a little bit run together, at least when I've chatted with people, is normally in, let's say, let's crudely put like public's good funding problems. So like there's, there's, there's a problem maybe of innovate, but let's just say for the moment, there's a simple thing we want to, um, I don't know, yeah, I mean, like in this case, let's say it's just a pure funding problem or even innovation of taking plastic out of the ocean. It's just, there's a question of like allocating funds. There's a question, there's a problem of how does money get distributed when it is in the public goods pot? Um, in many other examples, like which researchers do we fund? Right, right. We put up, collected this amount of money to pay for research. Yep. Um, or, uh, you know, we've got money to mitigate climate change or to reduce carbon emissions. What projects do we allocate it to? And there's another problem, which is how does money go into the pot? How do we raise the sure. money? Um, and th these problems are obviously somewhat related, which is that particularly if you're interested in voluntary uh, contribution to the, the, the fund, the pot, if you like, that if I have kind of faith in the allocation mechanism, um, I'm I'm going to be more willing to do it than maybe than than, than if I yeah. think the medicine is really bad or dictatorial. So yeah. classic, classically, um, people have felt um, you know like like for people for example within reason by lottery to, you know classic lotteries were one way to raise public funds because you, you you'd give out ten percent of the lottery amount or twenty percent or whatever to the actual winners and then you take the rest to do like build bridges or do something useful. Um, and people seem willing to buy lottery tickets the way they don't seem so willing to pay taxes. Um, right. So happy about it. But there's just a, a, a kind of question for me and some of it in the, in the things I've seen, which is, it's as if sometimes it's like coming up with good allocation or governance mechanisms for allocating money solves the problem of raising money. And obviously, traditionally, states have raised large amounts of money for public or at least they're you know sometimes from other perspectives like bad bad ends but they've seen be able to raise it because they have this just ability to kind of in democratic states sort of with everyone's agreement but traditionally just they could compel people to pay taxes they they could you know they they, they, they could enforce it through the, the monopoly on violence you know as it were yeah. um and i i'm a little bit sometimes trying to work out how uh people that issue which is and which is related to the free rider problem it's the converse. Yes. If, if the state kind of solves the free rider problem by saying, if you don't pay your tax, we're going to come and, you know, send the sheriffs round or send the bailiffs round to get stuff, which also makes me, you know, does, you know, otherwise you've got a major free rider problem. I'm going to contribute, but no one else will contribute. To, you know, you know, why would I rashly contribute when I could just reduce my contribution? Everyone else would do it. So I'm often intrigued about how, how these systems, one option could just be, it's going to be a much more efficient way for philanthropists to get together and fun things but how would how would we get how would one get kind of to kind of state levels of funding for things like this or is that not the intention of, of these things at the beginning or we just don't know we're like we're innovating right now we're going to explore and see um well it's funny two several things come up when you if you put it in that, that particular frame state levels of funding yeah now i mean me i'll work backwards from the one that popped into my head initially which is uh, just so you're quite clear, if you're engaging in state levels of funding, yes, that means you're taking that funding away from the states because that funding is fun is is finite. And there's a non-zero sum game there. <laughs> you have to either you're taking it directly from, either the states are taking it from people and then giving it to you, or you're taking it so the states don't have it. And I think that's appropriate. I think that's real. Yes. I mean that humans don't necessarily have to use the state to solve particular problems. They don't. No. And if this particular approach can solve a problem that is relevant, then those this, this should be the way of solving it. So that's just a, a thing to be thinking about. But it, course, it, yeah. it raises a very interesting thing to be considered. One, yes. one of the things you'll have to deal with if we can actually demonstrate that this is a, a good way of solving this problem is we'll have to learn how to gently pull the fingers of the state away from these resources that they're stewarding ineffectively yes. so that the resources can, in fact, be stewarded appropriately. OK, now, how, how do you get there? Okay, so there's, there's a. Wait, wait, just, just my question, because my question is more that the thing that you have in public goods problems, because whether the, the, the thing the state provides is a kind of an enforced agreement that we're all going to contribute in, like in a public goods game, right? Like we all sit around a table. So I, I used to play this kind of game with people, and I know there's many games used online, but for real, trying to explain like funding 
uh, medicines or other things, which is, you know, we've all got some and, and we're all going to put a secret amount of money into the pot. It's going to get multiplied by five or whatever your public's good multiplier is and then given back out. You know, like we're trying to fund a drug for cancer. If we all put uh, money in, yeah. we can fund the drug or whatever it is. How is the issue that we just say we don't need uh, we don't need inf- like like people are going to like contribute enough. Like what what stops the free rider problem leading to an unraveling sure. of the contribution? Maybe, yeah, well, this is yeah. this is um, you know, this is a problem that I suppose has always been a, a problem, yes. and that over the past what fifty to seventy years has actually been a real looking at the problem in in, in itself. And this is the pro- uh, one of the major questions that is under investigation in the space that I've, that I called Tao alchemy you know, yes. earlier. Yeah. So generally speaking, the way that one resolves this kind of problems, the, I apologize if, if, if this video gets shared at all, yeah. one of the things that's going to happen is it's going to be a, Hey, wait a minute. That just went to a very high level of abstraction. Yeah. And that's, that is the case. Right? So to think about it, we have to say, okay, we're dealing with a particular kind of problem. What's the kind of the, the geometry of the problem class. So we can begin thinking clearly about it. And, and it has something to do with the notion of boundaries interiors and exteriors and what it means to be in an interior and how do you actually um, uh, navigate the transition from the exterior to the interior. And and by the way, the other way around. So when we we describe a state now, and we can say the same thing about a corporation. So let's just use the example of existing structures. Yes. Um, If if I look at a a corporation and a state as two kinds of things that are defined by boundaries that have you are either in it or you're not. There's certain ways of defining whether you are or aren't. There's yes. ways of actually crossing the boundary. And there's relational capacities that happen depending on your status. So if I'm yes. inside a corporation, I might have access to a particular budget or some process whereby I can ask for a particular kind of budget. Um, I can have access to certain kinds of human resources and or a process whereby I can ask for, ask for certain kinds of resources. And of course, I'm subject to some kind of monitoring mechanism that evaluates my conditional access to the aforementioned budget and human resources. Yeah, that's yes. basically, I just defined a corporation and yes. each corporation is going to be a variation of answers to that set of how do you do that? Yes. Um, and at a meta level, by the way, we should say that the, the, the whole category of corporations is defined by the degree to which its particular set of answers to that question, set of questions, produces a set of activities that cause a flow of resources across its boundary from the exterior to the interior that is greater than the risk-adjusted equivalent of all other corporations in its local environment. You know, so we can actually do a very strong biomimicry, ecology, evolutionary uh, mapping and say, okay, yes. it's more fit in comparison to other kinds of organisms in its particular local environment. Yes. On the basis of its answers to these exact questions, right? that's it, that's the whole set of questions. All right, so then if I say a government or a state, now a state's very different, right? Because the state's boundary is not defined by merely the coordinated activities of the group of individuals who are in the interior of its, of its envelope. Right? Yeah. The state's boundary is in fact, typically defined by a geography, which is somewhat arbitrary. Um, either historically, those sorts of boundaries that were defensible, those sorts of boundaries that had certain levels or characteristics of fecundity or product, or the ones that people just happened to settle in before they stopped, right? That's more or less the whole set of things that ended up why certain boundaries are set. Um, and, then they, and, then, and then the boundary is drawn, right? And so now the, the state has a very different set of things that defer, determine the interiority and exteriority, right? Its capacity to maintain its, its actual physical boundary, its ability to literally defend the, uh, its interior from exterior forces. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, its ability to allow interior, uh, th- those in the interior, to engage in activities of the, af- the aforementioned corporate environment, right, to produce certain kinds of um, resources. Yes. Uh, and its ability to inhibit free rider problems in its interior. Yeah. Uh, so to produce, to sort of fill in the gaps between the, the, what we might call the more private or more um, uh, purely associative style. Yeah. yeah. So the, the category that we're dealing with right now, oh, sorry. So free rider problems arise in both, in all, in all kinds of these sorts of things. They could arise in all of them, exactly. Yes. In all of them. And uh, so when we look at the, ca- the case of how do we solve free rider problems in, say, the corporate construct, con- yeah. uh, construct uh, it's largely done by close monitoring. And so we, we, we will generally have some kind of, of, of 
context relevant human hierarchical monitoring. Yes. Management, right? The notion of management. Yes, yes, exactly. To get concrete, there's there's a team of people, Joe, Harry, and and Sally or whatever, building their piece of software or getting corn in the field, and someone's being like, hey, you know, Joe's slacking off and like getting the result of the whole team result, you know, the team effort. And you know, whether it's his teammates or it's the manager saying, okay, well, Joe's not either we're gonna lock, Joe's not gonna work this anymore, or we're gonna pay Joe less or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. And then um, the other one you'll have is is um, to a greater or lesser extent, sometimes less than the pre than this one or more, is the notion of metrics. And so yes. hey, did we hit our monthly targets? We, we said we we're gonna make a million dollars this quarter. Do we make a million? Yes or no? If yes, great. Go forward, do your thing. Yes. If no, no, then split. And by the way, we can we can actually do the same generalization math on uh, military. You know, set very similar with more yes. intensity. Right? How, how do you actually set objectives and measure and see whether or not people are performing effectively? Yes. Um, and then, as you say, in the state, the state tends to use uh, a mix of these same basic methodologies. And the difference is that in a corporate corporate environment, if you if you fail, if you if you're if you're not engaging in, in a level of contribution to the commons that meets the standards, then you are exited outside the boundary because the boundary is defined by membership in the interior of the boundary. It's inter- purely associative. Yeah. Uh, in the context of the state, because your association happens as a context as a consequence of your physical be- where you are geographically, yes. the state uses a different set of techniques to police free rider problems. Right? It, the notion of exile is really not used that much anymore. We don't often grab people and just throw them out of our state right. because there's no place to put them. Um, so so that, was the case. that was the case two or 3,000 years ago, but now it tends to be more, we're going to put you in jail. We're going to exile you interiorly. Create an interior space to put you in, right? Or, or we're going to put you in some kind of uh, higher intensity bureaucratic measurement place. Right? We'll put you yeah. on the dole and yeah. we'll give you a certain amount of resources and basically just accept that you are a certain kind of free rider and try to minimize that cost. Yes. Right? And that's the sort of sort of it. And then there's ameliorative efforts to reduce the likelihood that people will show up as free riders. You know, and this is a way of describing things like education or, or yeah. even propaganda. Yeah. Um, all right. So in this new category, the reason why I wanted to go through that whole process is to actually yeah. create sort of a shared vocabulary of what the yeah, space yeah, yeah. is and how the current. All right. So the new category um, adds the notion of being able to very precisely define. Um, highly legible, meaning it's very easy to perceive precisely what they are, transparent and immutable incentive landscapes that are permissionless, meaning people can choose, can choose to opt into playing by, uh, according to the incentive landscapes, but have no capacity to, in fact, actually even be a free rider in, in a very particular way. So let's just use Bitcoin as an example. And Bitcoin, by the way, from my point of view, is a DAO. Yes. Straight up, it just is a doubt. Okay, so first order, you know, for the free rider problem in these kinds of things happens in the periphery. So in the first order, um, and the way that Bitcoin works is I can choose to be a miner or not. And that's, that's the beginning of the incentive landscape. And so to participate in the commons, which for Bitcoin, the commons is literally itself. It is a kind of commons that produces a certain common value and people can begin to participate. If I choose to become a miner, I have a certain technical protocol, which is, Objective, I can see it. It's transparent. It's open source. Everybody can see it. Um, it's immutable in the sense that to change it is defined as a fork, which means that you actually have two different things that are happening, not one that's been changed. Yeah. Um, and my ability to participate is strictly governed. I either, I either engage in a valid action defined by this objective scheme or I don't. And if I don't, I just throw an error. I'm literally on the, I'm on the outside of the boundary, objectively. There's no way for me to, the whole point of Bitcoin is that I can't create, I can't engage in the double spending problem. I can't pretend that I'm playing by the rules and not be playing by the rules, but this is the whole Byzantine general's problem, right? The solution set is if you're running a full node and you are running the full node and you are solving the hashing problems and you are actually yeah. adding a valid block, there's a way of proving with certainty that you've added a valid block. And there's a way of game theoretically being quite like quasi certain. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. quasi certain. Like, yeah, quasi certain in the sense the majority goes with it. Yeah, that that you are playing a game that everybody agrees is the game that we all want to play together. And so you're not yeah. free riding. So that is in fact the canonical solution that is de- defines the notion of the DAO space. Right? We create an incentive landscape. Yeah. We create a set of objective software. Right? So they're algorithmic. They're not involving human interpretation um, rules 
that produce yep. incentive structures that create a game theoretic construct. And because they're objective software based, you, people either participate in a way that is valid or they, or they, or they don't. And then if you construct the game theory appropriately, you now have an incentive environment where people will, when they participate, it will automatically produce the results that we're looking for and will extinguish um, all kinds of defection behavior. So we now shift from a like free rider, which is a, a kind of defection behavior to game theoretic defection behavior, which is the larger, covers the whole category. Does that make sense? That move I just made there, I tagged it on the end because it wasn't. Well, so the question I, I have is, so classically, let's say, um, I, I'm just trying to think this through. So let's say that um, I'm, uh, let, let's just pick a concrete example. So let's say I'm funding software with a DAO. I'm going to say, here's this DAO that the aim of this DAO that we participate in is to fund the development of software at, of certain software acts. It, um, what I can understand at the moment is if I could, let's say that software is open source and someone who hasn't contributed to the DAO, who hasn't participated in DAO, hasn't contributed assets or energy to the DAO, uses that software, then, then you've got a free rider problem. The way that could be solved is if the software can only run inside of the system like it's running, everything's running inside of Ethereum and, and inside Ethereum, the rule is you can't use that software unless you participate in the DAO. But, you know, it would kind of be like yep. this incredible state. It would be like, but a state enforced by code. Like it's yep. like you, you have a world where I can only, everything's running in this, everything's running on this uh, computational system. And, and because I kind of have to participate in that system to kind of, participate in anything that's going on in life, the rules that were created for that stuff. It, so, but it would be a weird way to well, sort of be, you'd, me, you'd, but, but, I, but I'm saying, is that the idea? Then you'd- Yeah, well, let me, so let me say it a slightly different way. Yeah. Um, but you've got a bundling concept, which is what you were articulating. You, you, you sort of described it gigantically, but it doesn't have to be gigantic. Yeah. As long as I have things that I really, really want that are bundled really with things that I have to do, yeah. then, we're done, right? As long, as long as the my desire to get the things I want overcomes the advantage I might have by avoiding the costs that I have to pay to get them, and there's a boundary that means I can't get the thing I want unless I pay the costs, then I then I do the thing, right? So that's that's sort of the general category. And that and that's an analogy of that kind of with the state, which is that I could leave, you know, like maybe I could go somewhere very unattractive. I mean, let's even imagine there yeah. is some on Earth. It's highly unattractive, but I'm I'm there. I could be an anarchist, and I don't need. Like I can leave the U.S. I'm no longer going to pay taxes. I'm no longer going to. Right. Well, I'm in Israel. I'm no longer going to do military service. I'm not going to pay taxes. I'm not going to whatever. Have to learn Hebrew. I, but but it's kind of unattractive. Whereas being in Israel, I you know, you know, there's great education. There's you know, yep. there's, there's, a, there's a bundling. There's it's a exactly bundling. Bundling. That's yeah. why people want to go to the U.S. You know, you have to pay high taxes, corporation taxes apparently high in the US compared to certain jurisdictions, but but corporations incorporate there because there's something bundled with it, which is all these, you know, the culture, exactly. the people who are there, the amenities. So the, so the boundary, the, the boundary and the enforcement of the boundary in the context of code has these advantages of transparency, meaning you know precisely what is required to actually be in the boundary. Yeah. As the advantage of algorithmic, meaning that you don't have a bureaucracy, the, the cost of the human um, uh, overhead the of, of enforcement and monitoring and so on. Specifically, it's actually the, the, the sort of recursive free writing problem. Right? But once you create a bureaucracy to enforce a boundary, the bureaucracy becomes the free writer. It's a principal agent problem with the bureaucracy, at least. Yeah, principal agent problem, precisely. Yeah. So you yeah. don't have that, right? Once the code is written, the code is just runs. It just does what it does. Yeah. You may... You may you have a different set of problems, right? You may have written you may have unintended consequences. Yes, you may have uh, errors that you in in terms of um, well bugs really in the code, bugs in yeah. the code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bugs in the code. Yes, that's that's all. So it's not saying I'm not saying that we've just created something which is perfection. We're just saying it has no, a different set of capacity. It has a different set of strengths and weaknesses. Yes, right. So we now have a boundary which is now defined by code, and it has the strengths and weaknesses of being defined by code. Um, it's just enumerate a few of them. One is intrinsically global. Every human being who's connected to the digital environment can participate in the interiority of the boundary. That's yeah. nice. I get access in principle to the whole human family to potentially add their value to this particular problem. 
Second, um, has the, the speed of code means that the ability for people to enter and exit the boundary can actually be extremely rapid. It can be essentially instantaneous within you know, milliseconds. So I can do what I need to do to enter into a particular boundary, like to participate in a DAO on the inside of a DAO, give my value, and then I can exit. I can do it 15 times a day, right? The, yeah. which is very different than trying to join a company or, and immigrate to a state, right? And that temporal yeah. element matters a lot in terms of what the actual, uh, the way the, the topology will evolve. You know, because you can operate, everybody in the world can, op- can participate in some way, but the boundaries can actually be defined according to very rapid entry and exit. Mm-hmm. And then third, uh, and kind of like an IoT metaphor, I can actually create, I can move into the code layer a very large amount of activity of relationality between DAOs, between these things that have boundaries that are entirely driven by uh, software again. And so I can have, for example, um, human comes into a particular location and does a certain kind of work. And then a DAO actually is able to engage in a flow of activity in the computational communications with three other DAOs that it's connected to that are that involve no human oversight at all. And you can just go. And a human can be brought, can be requested to participate only when human agency is needed. And so that's another characteristic of what happens when, when the boundary is being governed by code is a lot of stuff can be delivered. This is, you know, commonplace in the computational substrate. You know, if you, uh, yes. uh, your, your, your messaging infrastructure, like, like uh, my calendar, is yeah. doing lots of stuff in the background that I don't pay any attention to. And then it alerts me, hey, it's time for your call. And so I, yeah. enter and I come through the boundary and I participate. Um, there's only a couple of things that actually aren't currently quite present and probably the most important of which is a form of identity that is bound to the physical. This is the, the virtual physical binding problem. Right now in the, in the, in the blockchain universe, for the most part, uh, identity is strictly virtual. You have a wallet. Yeah, you your have it. Yeah. Um, and it's not bound to your physical. Yes. To who you are as a person. And I, I, can, I will argue if, you, if you'd like, but I will simply pause it right now axiomatically that that actually needs to be solved. At a minimum, at the very minimum, you need to have a un- unification and the, uh, the ability to prove that a human is a biological human and not an AI to have yeah. this system operate. That's, I just added a whole bunch of things, but that's the thing that has to be dealt with at some point. Um, so, so, so what we look at now is we end up having something that actually looks a lot like an ecosystem. Right? Yes. Different kinds of boundaries, many of which will actually contain other kinds of, this use the term, holonic structures. Yeah. I might have a, a DAO that deals with the ocean. Interior to the DAO, I'm actually dealing with, with the uh, marine biology. And I'm also dealing with um, coral reefs, and I'm also dealing with plastics, which are all problems in there. The holonic structures can also be cross-nested. So the, the, the holon that's inside an oceanic holon that's dealing with coral reefs might also be part of a separate holon that's dealing with um, carbon sequestration. Right? And so it actually yeah, is, yes. can cross over. Right? These are very interesting things that can be done, which are, if you're familiar with code, this is not at all interesting. But if you're, if you're familiar with trying to do this with human systems, you're like, holy shit, that's a very powerful new technology. Yeah. Um, all of which, by the way, can be plugged into an entire IoT strat, strat, substratum, which includes things like uh, perception, so sensors. So yes. I can have a whole field of sensors that are actually part of this infrastructure that are communicating information. And that information can actually trigger events inside the, the DAO environment and surface events to humans only when humans are particularly um, you know, human expertise or sense-making or evaluation or agency is particularly necessary, right? So this, this is the whole separate thing. The thing is the bundling, the fact that I kind of like, if, if I start free, like there's, there's DAO to fund, I, I, even that we could take it physically, let's take the information here. There's a DAO that funds computer, software X. Yep. I, um, you've been part of the DAO. I haven't, I haven't contributed to whatever, but I go and like kind of use this. So I'm taking, I'm free riding potentially yep. on this, on this thing. The point will be, this will some, I will, because my software will somehow be connected to the underlying uh, electronic infrastructure. It, I will get locked down. I will, because I will have like, vi- like the, the terms of this software might've said, this is open to everyone who participates in, in, in Dow X, but no one else. Yep. You know, I will be locked out of it. And, and the reason I can't free ride is because 
I'll be part of some information system that I need to use that 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 is connected though to the kind of enforcement of contracts regarding the the DAO. That, yep. that the DAO. Or if we took the ocean, if I want to go and swim in the ocean, it's plastic free. Somehow it will notice I'm swimming in the ocean and be like, hey, you didn't contribute to the clean up the ocean DAO, um, and you're swimming in the ocean. You know, that doesn't really, you know, like mm, you're kind more, of free riding free, you didn't pay your tax, like it'd be the equivalent of me like you said to me, yeah. Is, yeah, pay not paying my taxes more, or not. Or more not likely, pay. more likely it'll be something like um, well, let me just add some more vocabulary. Yeah. There's another there's another whole chunk of category of vocabulary here that just it helps its part. Yeah. So reputation. Kind of, yes. It was known as reputation back in the day. I don't know what it's gonna be known in the future, but reputation is a part of this thing, right? And so yeah. at a minimum, and this is the key, at a minimum, you have a digital identity that is attached to your physical being. That's why why I went there. Once you've got that, then that ends up acting as your permiss your your permission that gives you access to everything that is now being governed by this sort of ecosystem of DAOs and IoT. And so it may be that as long as you have a reputation, you know, just a generic reputation score above green, you you participated in something you can go anywhere to value. Yeah. You can swim in the ocean, right? It, just, right? it doesn't have to be one-to-one. It doesn't now, have to be related to the particular DAO. There'll be some kind of, what you're saying is then that, that will become some numeraire, AKA classically, traditionally money. Like I didn't barter goods, but in this one, I end up converging on some equivalent numeraire, which everything will get converted into that allows me to kind of aggregate up. We, call, we just called it reputation, but something like that. That means yep. I, if my score is enough, I can do this thing or not do this thing. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, this, this, this conditionalizes a number of different kinds of things. And to yeah. see, let me just quickly over here, kind of put the Chinese social credit score flag. Yeah. Yeah. Because that will come up for people, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and it's actually what we're, we're talking about. It's, it's just not, it's not, not dodge the bullet. I yeah. have bad news for you. Yeah. That's the future, right? The question is not, are we going to be governed by something like that? The question is, is it going to be controlled by the CCP? Or is it going to be a decentralized, bottoms-up, human-liberating kind of thing? Right? That's, yes. that's the question. Right? It's yes. not. And by the way, it's only the latter that will even create space to allow people to truly choose to opt out and actually live a completely non-digital life. Right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. I think, I think this is, I just think it's so, yeah, I think it's great that we're addressing that point head on because the, the thing is, as you say, like I think the knee-jerk reaction misunderstood, exactly. It's kind of like, it's it's like what I, I kind of the response to maybe trivial anarchism or you know what I call teenage anarchism but like yeah, yeah. you can't tell me how to play my music well go then go pay for your own rent <laughs> ultimately we need to fund we need to live my rules you know my rules but but it's more the other way around if we want a commons which ironically many of like the people who might react to that might be progressive kind of in a sense it's like if we want a resource commons if we want it we do need to have a system there needs to be some system that that bundles, if you like. I mean, or there needs to be space you can completely opt out and and kind of be a total autarky or whatever. But I think that's a really fine. And the key point is, who who how do we who controls this emission? Is it democratic? Is it distributed? Is it decentralized? Is yep. it uh, participatory? Um, but it's not that we don't want any any kind of rules because to some extent, without that, how do we how do we resource the how do we manage commons problems which are our central a central yeah. issue of our time. Yeah. It's, 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 um, yes, I've, I've already said it. It's, from my point of view, it's, it is a foregone conclusion that the question is, is how and what, not if. This is just how it's going to be. Um, and, and again, it is only to the degree to which there is a version of this kind of a, uh, an infrastructure that has a human. Uh, individual or this kind of sole individual being uh, as a as a, of a valorized component that things like choosing to truly opt out will even be rendered available at all or not radically radically marginalized um, and the, the highly centralized autocratic structures are not famous for the degree to which they care about your desire to live on your own farm by yourself unmolested yes. Well, they, they, in fact, there's very good reasons 
that they 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 would want to prevent that since it would it would often if they have an unsuccessful system people would be rapidly leaving as as often happened in in, in behind the iron curtain i think yeah, i just want to em- emphasize emphasize a, 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 another another point there that i think is um it's just it just sit for me but it's like if the on the on the progressive sort of um Oh, that's it. Which is that the thing is, swarming looks a bit like that today. And this is another reason this could be kind of attractive is it's called money. Like today, crudely, the, the thing we know, the current system uses this numerator of like value, aka price. And the, one of the great illusions, I mean, I always love Oscar Wilde's line that a cynic is the man who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Mm. Those two things are not are not the same, but in our current system, the kind of equivalent of reputational value is crudely, in, in a reductionist sense, what you've got paid or what it was, what, how much would you pay for that? Oh, and no, this, this, it's, it's very I, powerful. I, I, Think about how powerful that is. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. this is an interesting loophole in the way, that, like it's a huge error in the way that yeah. money works. Uh, it creates this bizarre social consequence that... The fact that you were able to accrue some large amount of what in the internet now are being called trash tokens, yeah. say US dollars, um, for some reason implies that you actually have a generically, universally applied positive reputation. Yes, exactly. Whoa. Why, why would it be the case that we should assume that, um, you know, pick random billionaire has you know, that order of magnitude, more capacity in any domain other than the one they happen to have used to accrue billionaire status. And yet, because money is a generic choice making uh, token, and it has, it's, it's, it's unidimensional, it's only one, then it has to apply to everything. Uh, it's, you know, a very odd consequence of the way that money works. So we can think about this system that I'm discussing as sort of the implication of what would happen if you had conditional, meaning qualitatively diverse, and high dimensional, many, many different variations on money. Yes. Um, let's see. And I would maybe to layer on just one other piece that is not at all commonly included is I'd like to then in- introduce or reintroduce indigenous wisdom. And the, the sort of the, 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 the raw code of being a well-formed human in holistic right relationship with a particular place, right? It's indigenous wisdom. It's the both, right? You have to actually be a human and you have to have a relationship with the place to be truly indigenous. Um, and what I would say is something like the, 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 the deepest element of the thing that I'm describing is to actually bring us humans into a new indigenousness, which has to do with two different kinds of place. Well-formed human, And the place is simultaneously the world, all of the world, Gaia, taken as a whole, as a fully integrated wholeness, and the noosphere, the realm of the things that humans do specifically, mind, thinking. Uh, To be indigenous to the whole world as a fully integrated whole and indigenous to the noosphere in the context of being a truly well-formed human, I would call that... Uh, the sort of the design criteria of this, you know, what, what a, a, a well-produced sort of DAO IoT ecosystem looks like at the big picture. And some really interesting things come up when you begin to think in that way, because, <laughs> funny, in states, because states are largely parasitic predators on indigenousness, we have a whole lot of holdover concepts that we reify poorly, but they really just come from an older frame, like adult. And so we have a notion in a state that you get conditional access to certain kinds of capacities by means of having become adult. Like you can drive a car or you can drink vote. alcohol or you can vote. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and by the way, you can, in some cases, you could be conscripted to fight. And these are yes. things that happen. Now, in the context of a state, these kinds of things are managed very poorly. They largely make no sense uh, because as we can say with pretty high degree of, of precision, the fact that you are 18 is almost like the fact that you're a billionaire in the sense that it speaks very little about your actual capacity to do any of these things. Yeah. You know, in an indigenous context, they have a very different notion. It's called being an adult. To be an adult means that you've actually gone through a boundary that has very context aware, very precise, very bespoke, that qualifies you to participate 
as an adult in the group. This notion of context, rich, rich context, and this notion of high bespoke, which can't be processed with the amount of complexity available in a state, can be processed with the amount of complexity available in a DAO ecosystem. And so your boundary is in fact your boundary. And we don't have to be thinking about it as these generic metrics that are extremely rough categories like being 18 or 21 or whatever it is. We can actually be very precise around you. Well, I want to just, but I want to push on this a little bit here because the thing is that to, to say is, I think, so I think, I, so first of all, everything you said, I think is, is just spot, spot, also actually quite beautiful, but really spot on. I think the thing I want to push on is to say, to let, let's say I was being like generous to the state to say, why did this happen? Um, for example, um, you know, even why does bureaucratization happen? Why, you know, I, I thought about this quite a lot um, in, even I remember thinking about like, it, 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 there's been a general tendency though, know, where, I mean, there's been a general tendency in this increase in bureaucracy in modern states, in, in turning things into rules that were what I would call judgments in the sense of someone used their judgment about something. Um, you know, take just, I mean, take something like sentencing guidelines. Judges would have just, I mean, even something really is fundamental. Like what I mean is that really relates like how long do people go Absolutely. to prison for? Yeah. And, and we move from like people using their discretion to being like, um, and what I'm trying to get is there's something quite subtle in the culture about um, we've got to kind of be rational. We've got to be objective. We've got to be fair. And, and so I guess I've got a couple of questions, which is the things that made state so crude and, and, and so imperfect somehow might relate to scale that as they yep. kind of got bigger over time and it was like and, and things were almost well-intentioned you know like oh we you know um you want to make it more fair that's a good well, one well, let, let me take a really good example that i think is, is, is kind of famous it's like you in general as i understand the us you should not ask a candidate for a job to do an iq test because of duke uh, Duke, I mean, I can't remember X versus Duke in the 70s, which Duke Power were using IQ tests to basically exclude African Americans from getting jobs with Duke Power, even though it was irrelevant to the roles that they were getting. And so, right. as a general, what seemed like quite a good principle, but as you just said, is a very crude rule, becomes a rule versus saying you shouldn't use this for roles where IQ is irrelevant. You might say, well, IQ, we don't have a problem maybe testing equivalent IQ for going to university. And so I guess one of the questions that would be interesting is, are these features, like we can obviously be more precise with the metrics and, and what you, and, and to go back maybe to your point about indigenous, indigenous, what I can imagine, rites of passage or the things we could imagine, which are uh, rich, context specific, varied, would be, might be varied by the individual, kind of they sit within a community of practice. I think yeah. that's what you're talking about, DAOs even. And that community of practice has often limits on it on it on its size because community of practice and, and again just to take another example this thing to take one other example of the regularization i saw you know in, in many other kind of forms of healing let's take osteopathy or something i, I just picked kind of typical practice 30 40 years ago people were osteopaths they probably didn't have a certificate from the state they didn't need to be part of some approved body and you were probably recommended by you know, this person was was kind of like from this genealogy. I mean, it's probably the same thing for, I know, a Tai Chi master. They, while there are Tai Chi associations, it's still more like, who was your master? Who was your master's master? Wh who have you practiced with? And is there a question which I think is, you know, part of this is like, is it that therefore down or other these things, what they might allow and might be crucial is that they can operate, we can network them together in a way that allows given ones to say small, but somehow aggregate those to the scale that we need to address global problems. Yes. Is that... Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, the, the way that I've told this particular story, and ironically enough, right after this call, I'll be participating in the, uh, a short film that was produced, an animated film around the game A, game B construct. Uh, so the way that I have articulated this particular area of inquiry, uh, after some significant thought around these questions, was precisely around the notion of scale. So that there was a, there's a moment where what I call the Dunbar limit, right? the, at, the, at the Dunbar scale, yeah. we have certain capacities of being able to engage in certain kinds of, of governance, right? Certain qualitative, just I was describing the indigenous mode, 
And so yeah. highly qualitative, highly context specific at a level that we moderns have no real ability to even understand the level, that, the level of intimacy and context specificity that we just, we don't know anybody as well as any indigenous person knows everybody in their group. Yeah. Um, but that's what was available. Uh, and that has a whole like huge consequences in terms of feedback loops and how you actually are able to perceive when defection behavior is happening and what it means to choose defection behavior, what it means to exit the group. I mean, think about the gradient of to be exiled from a group in the indigenous mode is a level of catastrophe that we can't comprehend, right? Yes. Because you know, the, 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 the distance between you and some other group is effectively infinite. So the raw wilderness, you're dead. Any other group, you're kind of dead too. Like it's really big deal. So obviously you're, you're going to not want to leave the group and the group you know, will police behavior easily. Okay. But that Dunbar limit, there's an, a niche. I mean, my, the way I tell the story, that there's a niche that is explored in human relationships, right? Different groups are now competing with each other all within roughly the Dunbar limit, all exploring different variations. And there's ways to achieve a certain level of scale. Now, some of those ways are unstable. I mean, sort of authoritarian chiefdoms organized under some strong leader who combined like 10 Dunbar scale groups. But when the authoritative chieftain dies, it tends to break apart pretty quickly. It's very rare for those to, to be able to survive intergenerational. Genghis Khan's children. And Alexander the Great's generals, right? We even see that even in larger scale in, in other groups. But... There's, an expo there's a discovery of a particular mode, which I just call game A. And the, what, what the game A mode does is it produces the notion of the formal as more fundamental than the notion of the informal, or more specifically, it allows the decontextualization of human relationships in very particular ways. And so for example, the, the example I use the most often is I can take the role of chief or king and attach the meaning of that role to the, to, the, to the formal category, not to the person who happens to sit in that, in that throne. And so Joffrey from Game of Thrones is afforded the, the, all the powers of king because he happens to hit the formal requirements of king, even though we all know he's terrible. Uh, this could not happen in an indigenous environment. You know, if, if somebody's actually terrible, they're just not in charge. It's very simple. Um, it doesn't matter if your dad was the chief. If you're terrible, somebody else is is, is running things because it's we'll very challenge odd. you and you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're done, right? But in the game A mode, what happens is we discover the power of being able to actually prioritize the decontextualized formal virtual architectures that live in the mind, right? Not in context specific relationality that can be abstracted, and we begin to explore the possibility space of that, and that includes a lot of stuff like agriculture. Right? Instead of a contextual relationship with organic plants in their context, we realize that we can decontextualize them, optimize for very specific characteristics that are no longer the whole, but are actually our analytical parts, and increase yield in particular ways that we care about. Right? So we can actually do the same thing. Animals, right? we can domesticate animals in certain ways, pull cows out of being you know, wild animals and domesticate them. And of course, we can domesticate humans. This allows us to optimize along particular characteristics that we can identify as being relevant, but it also will always throw externalities into areas that perhaps we can't perceive either at the micro scale or in temporal scales that we can't fully understand. Right? So this is a, a sort of the blind spot that game A runs into that isn't necessarily realized or, or things we just can't manage because the complexity is too high. Like where our lifespans are decreasing and our, our teeth are rotting because our nutrition is actually not adequate, but we don't really understand what's going on. No, we're just getting sick or suddenly um, we're getting viruses and bacteria that didn't exist before because we're actually living in close proximity yeah, to animals, but we don't understand yeah. what's going on. So that's the, 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 black, the, the, the blind spot, but this becomes the thing because it can scale, right? It can scale and it can optimize. This gives it the ability to say, Hey, if I've got a, a group of 10,000 people and you're limited to a group of 200, 300, 400, then maybe you can bind together a few bands to sort of fight together for a while, but I can actually get 10,000 people. And by the way, I can take of those 10,000, I can take a thousand young males and optimize them as warriors, just have them do nothing but learn how to fight. And I can take another group of people and optimize them as engineers of weapons of war. So now my warriors aren't just good at fighting, they're also holding bronze swords. You indigenous folks are fucked. Yeah, yeah. No, right. absolutely. Now, now game theory kicks in, you know, even though it might be 
better or worse, when I call it the Nike swoosh, human yeah. well-being probably went down and then it's been on a long trajectory getting a bit better. But even so, game theory will now kick in and I'll wipe out the the, the indigenous relatively. Yeah. If I don't play game A, I just eat, get eaten by game A. So either I, I, I choose to play game A or I become a slave in the game A context. Those are the two and choices I got. We get nuclear weapons or something that's asymmetric, which suddenly allows small groups or something democratic, something happens to take a long time until there's some great advantage of different ways of organizing. Yeah. So, so to the point, right? so now accelerate forward. The constraints that show up in every example of game A show up in every example of game A. So the modern nation state is a particular try, uh, effort to try to solve problems of scale, problems of informational complexity. Right? Okay, the bureaucracy is basically governed by its capacity. The amount of information it can process is the amount of information it can actually optimize for. So I can only optimize for, I can only process a certain amount of information. So I have to focus on that set of characteristics. I can optimize that, but I'm going to be doing it at the cost of all the other stuff that I can no longer perceive or manage. So it's yeah. going to throw externalities everywhere else. Yeah. Um, and where we live now, which is that the this very specific piece of the game, theme, game theoretic characteristic around increasing technological capacity, even when it is in fact globally suboptimal. Yes. Right? We've reached the point where that's where we are. Yeah. Know, whether it's whether it's nukes or CRISPR or I don't know or AI or whatever. Recklessly produced research on viruses or AI for sure, right? To to the point, like all the guys who are engaging in the cutting edge of AI are completely aware of this problem. Now, and that by the way is now that completely outstrips the governance capacity in game A in general. And this is basically my the key point I was trying to make 10 years ago. Game A as a category of governance runs aground at this problem. It cannot govern that magnitude of power at that level of fine grainedness. You need something which has the wisdom gap. A different the wisdom gap yeah. has grown too big. Between, it's good it's, yeah. and catastrophic. So we need something new. That was that was basically what pointed my attention in the direction of the thing that is now DAO space. Is this new thing looks like something that has the ability to allow the truly human, you know, in, intuitive, context-specific, bespoke, wise and virtuous human to be in the front and supports that with a, a, a computational infrastructure, which by the way, actually has a vastly higher computational capacity in terms of both velocity and fine-grainedness, but it can't be that, just that, it has to be both in relationship with each other. And then we can partition in the, the problem space that we're trying to govern so that, you know, render unto the computer what can be computed, but render unto the human, which must be held by the human. And that's sort of the, the simple statement. Um, wow, that was a long journey. <laughs> we went, went from a uh, sort of very concrete thing that's ready at hand right now, but it's, it's meaningful in this much larger context, right? So, you know, I'm here because of that. That's why we're having this, why I'm sitting on this side of the screen is, fuck, we got to solve a gigantic problem. Our current toolkit not only can't solve it, but it's just going to make it worse every time make it tries it. to solve it. Yeah. What do we do? Well, let's investigate. Oh, this is the basic shape of what that solution looks like. Hey, people seem to be discovering different pieces of this every year. It's interesting. I so I got a, but I got a question. So to, to for it might be, which is to say, so one, so one, one question is, and we, you know, is. Maybe I bring an analogy, which and I think it's a both and here. So the question is, um, and and I I, I um, I'm kind of kind of I'm get, taking a couple of examples of David Wilson's Darwin's Cathedral, which is over time what you're describing to some extent are, are solving maybe even collective goods, which are informational problem. I mean, are, are kind of like how do we understand what we're doing and then act on that understanding? Like in a sense, how do we get wiser? Mm -hmm. um, one way to, to go back to just classic public goods problems, a couple of examples from that, from that, from Darren's Cathedral, I really love one is the bar. I think it's Bali, but the, the water temple system, the religion that underpinned sharing water from the mountain volcano to agriculture around, which was, well, you know, you had a massive uh, potential free rider problem of people, but you had this kind of religious, like there were the gods, and that you shouldn't take too much and kind of, and so yep. on. Um, so one of the things I guess I'm wondering is there's a sort of story here that somehow um, that there's a kind of cultural innovation or cultural progress 
that's in our sort of our worms is running through kind of religion. And the other example from the book that I found very powerful was about Christianity, just kind of talking about, well, at the beginning, Christianity was like, you know, like, for example, you, he, he gives a really concrete example that I think is amazing. He's saying, listen, Christians probably just did better during epidemics. Epidemics were very widespread during the Roman Empire. And Christians had a thing of like, you'd go into your neighbor's house, even when he was, rather than fleeing, uh, this is maybe relevant even right now during COVID, you'd go in your neighbor's house and kind of tend to them. And the evidence we have from today is just, while there is obviously a risk to you, overall, going in and just providing people with water and basic kind of support massively increased their chance of surviving whatever epidemic they were going through. And this is an example of kind of like built into Christianity was, you know, treat your neighbors yourself and so on. So I kind of wondering, which is to say, I kind of get that, that what, one of the things I guess in the background is, as DAOs try and scale, they'll run into the same kind of political uh, capture problems to some extent that we risk in any system. And are we also going to need some degree of kind of like, like it, it, are we need some degree of our like development in our being, like that, that this also we're kind of, there's some wisdom development in how we then act in these things. These things allow us to scale, I, I'm kind of understanding in some way, but what will allow us to scale the wisdom? Is it just purely the fact we have the computational backbone, we have this way to network DAOs together easily? Or is there going to be some cultural work well, and kind of consciousness I would, that go with I would, say, I would say in some sense, maybe two or three things in my... my yeah, I can see. Uh, should have, sort of a little bit. Um, we're near the end of it for today anyway, we're good. Yeah. So one is taking virtue seriously. Uh, I would say that, the, that we're at a point right now where we can actually really, I think, quite be quite thoughtful about this notion of virtue and of which wisdom is a virtue, right? So I'm just sort of the whole category of those kinds of things. Taking the sacred seriously, right? The sacred is real. Just uh, the sacred is real. Now the question is, how do we, as individuals, begin the process of actually rediscovering how to be in a sacred relationship with the sacred? So taking it seriously. Second, leveraging the fact that our tremendous technological process afford us, affords us the ability to actually do so. Right? There, there's a uh, the, we, we, we're in this weird circumstance. This is something I discussed even earlier in my life, which was, I call it the great transition. And we're in this weird circumstance that according to most metrics, we'll all be unemployed in a few years um, because all the various technologies that are coming out are really beginning to eat the kinds of things that humans have been doing as their sort of labor vocation. And we have like two paths. One path is the shitty version of unemployment where everybody just is living meaningless lives of maybe being on the dole and not have... The other version is the awesome version of unemployment, which is, no, actually, you're fully employed. You're focusing on developing virtue and cultivating virtue in yourself, the people you love, and the communities you're part of. And so taking virtue seriously goes very nicely with liberating human beings to take virtue seriously by virtue of actually liberating them from the stuff that have, has taken our time, particularly in the context of game A. Abundance, essentially. We're yes. in an age of abundance, un unparalleled. And which Trans transitioning from the double whammy, right? one version is scarcity, and the other version is, what, what, how did Tyson say it? Um, heaps. You know, heaps is what, what happens when, or like obesity, heaps, heaps is what happens when scarcity perceives abundance as having a whole lot of, 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 meta -scare, of ma maximum scarcity. Like I have a thousand pounds of grain. No, that's not abundance, that's heaps. What I actually need is thrivingness, evolvability. Mm. Yeah, the yeah. totally different kind of thing. Flourishing, yeah. Thurish, a, a flourishing, exactly. What it does is shifts, by the way, from the, think about the mindset, the mindset of the small number of narrowly understood metrics that I can optimize for. And that's the game A mindset. The game A mindset says, oh, the opposite of scarcity is a billion dollars. No, this new thing is qualitative, back into the contextual, back into the nuance, the subtle, the bespoke, the individual. How do we actually cultivate virtue, which as we know, in the context of wisdom, wisdom is about complexity. Wisdom is about how do I make effective choices in the context of an actual complex reality that I live in? That's wisdom, yeah? Um, and so, yes, I would say the centerpiece of this is liberating human beings to cultivate virtue, to take virtue seriously, which means to tap into the wisdom traditions and all the wisdom that humanity has ever produced, which all basically grounds in how do we actually solve the problems of living in a complex reality well, consistently with other human beings? Um, and then again, now we can thoughtfully, carefully, carefully, not recklessly, carefully offload 
a bunch of stuff to the automation and basically build another layer of natural law. I'm thinking about the, the, this is an example I, I remember giving a while back. I'll do it this way. There's a little, my daughter made a bracelet. Um, you know, when I drop this, I don't have to take any responsibility for the fact that it's going to fall. That happens to be baked into this beautiful substrate known as reality that I navigate. And if I'm surfing on a wave, there's a beach behind me, um, I get to take advantage of the fact that almost everything about that is baked into a substrate reality that I have no responsibility for. I have to actually only deal with a very small portion, which are the choices I'm making. Code is the human capacity to add to that substrate. We can carefully add more and more layers of things that are done at the level of stuff that human beings don't have to take responsibility for directly. But of course, we do have to take responsibility for everything we put into the world. So we still have a sort of human sovereign governance of the technical layer, the new, the, the noetic layer. We have to become indigenous to the noetic, noetic. And as I said, indigenous to the whole of the world, which now because with the technical layer, we will destroy if we don't take responsibility for it. But this allows us to push a lot of this into a substrate that frees us to continue to cultivate precisely our capacity to use Tyson's word to become a um, the custodial species. Custodial, yeah. Sorry, custodial species. All right. Got it. Yeah. Go. Uh, we, we are, I think, uh, we're at a good point to pause for, for today. Nice. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, been... And is there anything else you'd like to say today in checkout? No. How about you? Uh, well, for me, it's, it's been a real pleasure I, I enjoying this. Um, I'll come back if, uh, yeah, no, it's, I really, I look forward to our next call or chat at some point. Um, yeah, it's been really interesting uh, today. So thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> nice. All right. Ciao. Have a wonderful day on the beach, I hope. Or... <laughs>